Hello everyone and welcome to another episode of the True Blue Crime Podcast. My name is Dan and as always I will be your host for this episode. Once again we will step away from the world of homicide to pursue a slightly different avenue of true crime. I do like to do that from time to time so I can talk about something other than innocent people being killed and the motives behind it. Today's story will involve a death but it'll be a bizarre suicide that captured headlines around the world. Before we get to that, let's cover the business. If you'd like to get updates about what the podcast is up to, please like and follow the True Blue Crime Productions Facebook page. More information can be found at the show's website at truebluecrimeproductions.com. And if you'd like to email the host directly, my email is truebluecrimeproductions at gmail.com. If you can, please support the show via Patreon. Any donation level helps, and it will help ensure I can keep making free episodes of the podcast and expand the podcast in the future. Any donations will receive a shout out in a future podcast and a thank you message from the host. Also, for no cost whatsoever, please rate and review the show on whatever platform you're listening to it on. Thanks so much, and without any further ado, let's dive into this episode of True Blue Crime. When is a man's life worth less than that of a slave in pre Civil War America? Well, it's when that man was an Irishman. To be fair, it is only because a slave held value to his or her immoral owner. But an Irish immigrant in 1850 Nashville held no value. When the Nashville and Chattanooga Railroad was being built, engineers had to solve the issue of the Cumberland Plateau. If they could connect the rail line from Nashville to the existing lines, it would change the time it took to travel from Nashville to Atlanta or Savannah from a week to a single day. But solving this issue required a tunnel, and making a tunnel in those days was hard and dangerous work. Workers needed to blast and haul rock and work in extremely unstable and filthy conditions. Originally, local slave owners were offered compensation for allowing the railroad to use their slaves for the tunnel labor, but after the first slave died, his owner sued the railroad and the courts ordered the railroad to pay the owner $1,200 or the equivalent of $50,000 today. Not wanting to pay out large sums of money every time a slave died, the railroad turned to Irish immigrants to fill the role. Desperate for money, they worked for low wages, and if one of them died, it didn't cost the railroad much money to replace them. The slaves were used for less dangerous hard labor, while the Irish risked life and limb in the tunnel. The addition of cholera outbreaks added to the danger as hundreds in the area died of the disease in a matter of weeks. To prevent spread of the infection, the bodies of workers who died from the disease were often thrown into a cabin, and then the cabin was burned down. Between disease and construction accidents, the human cost to build the railroad is beyond measure. The mortality rate was high, and there are rumors of unmarked graves and cemeteries scattered along the Cumberland Plateau. When the tunnel was finished in 1851, it helped open the middle of Tennessee to valuable trade with major shipping areas on the East Coast. Today, Nashville has grown to a city of almost 700,000 people and is known as Music City as it's the center of the world of country music in the United States. Nashville serves as the home location for several large companies, and the city's AT&T building is the tallest building in Tennessee. On Christmas Day 2020, a man decided to end his life by blowing himself up in downtown Nashville. Many Americans worried it was another act of domestic or international terrorism, but the real story is both sad and confusing. This is the story of the Nashville Christmas bombing. Christmas Day in America is supposed to be a day filled with fun, family, and memories. Most businesses, shops, and non-essential services are closed for the day, so families can either celebrate the Christian holiday and or enjoy the time together. Cheesy movies, professional sports games, and family traditions occupy the day, and for the most part, violence and things like terrorism are not on the minds of most people. But on December 25, 2020, in a year that most people say was the most tumultuous in recent history for many reasons, the year of weird wasn't quite finished yet. At 6.30 a.m., a large blast ripped through downtown Nashville, Tennessee. While many in America and around the world woke up to the developing story, for those in the immediate area, their overnight from Christmas Eve into Christmas morning had been anything but ordinary. At 1.22 a.m., a medium-sized recreational vehicle, or RV, 
parked outside an AT&T network facility located on 2nd Avenue North. This is in downtown Nashville near the Coyote Ugly Bar, made famous by the movie of the same name, and across the river from Nissan Stadium, home of the NFL's Tennessee Titans. Roughly four hours after the vehicle parked on the street, residents in nearby condos and apartments heard what they described as rapid gunfire in three bursts. The loud sounds woke up most residents, and then they heard a computerized woman's voice over a loudspeaker saying, all buildings in this area must be evacuated now. If you can hear this message, evacuate now. Groggy homeowners called police, likely thinking the disturbance was the work of some misguided teens or some social media prank. While well, police responded to several reports of gunshots in the area, the loudspeaker on the RV continued to blast out warnings. The warnings included, stay clear of this vehicle, do not approach this vehicle, and your primary objective is to evacuate these buildings now. And at some point, the warnings broadcasted that there was a bomb in the vehicle. So we'll take an aside here and just talk about the police response to something like this. Anytime that when I was a police officer, we had a report of shots fired or, or gunshots in an area, First off, it was usually fireworks. Um, not that Christmas is known for fireworks, but uh, usually in the summer here in Minnesota, around the 4th of July, and, and really all through the summer, uh, we would often get reports of gunshots. And it got to the point where if you just got a call or maybe two, and it was some type of single large boom or, or something, and they said it sounded like fireworks in the area, you, you kind of got used to just driving to the area and there wasn't really a big deal. Most officers would just advise uh, because we had single car patrols uh, or single officer vehicle patrols. So we didn't have two officers in most of our squads unless one was training. Uh, so a lot of the times our dispatchers would send two vehicles or to a call, but a single officer would get on the radio and say, I'm going to advise on that, uh, trying to keep other uh, squads available for other calls. And in the, in the case of this, where it was possible fireworks or a single person calls in saying they heard what they believed to be gunshots, it, was, it wasn't really treated as a big deal. But if we would get four, five, six, ten sometimes calls all saying people think they heard gunshots in an area, more times than not, it was actually going to be gunshots in the area and we would treat it that way. Now this is Christmas day, or I should say Christmas morning. And I think this started, uh, it was around 5 a.m., somewhere around there, uh, when the initial blast of the gunshots, somewhere, somewhere around 5 a.m. And holidays for whether you work in healthcare or law enforcement or anything, whether that's a essential job where you're not going to have the holiday off there tend to be a little more laid back uh, people like to sit around the station for the most part and just kind of enjoy each other's company you're away from your families at that time you're not getting to celebrate the holiday at least during your shift with your family uh, so you're with your second family your other officers your co-workers and so when this initial call comes out even though they're going to get multiple calls of gunshots in the area I'm assuming they just send a couple cars as in hey we'll go check it out uh, for all we know it's, it's fireworks it's Christmas morning somebody being an idiot uh, you know we don't really expect there to be gunshots in downtown Nashville at five o'clock in the morning on Christmas morning so that's what's gonna happen is a couple officers are gonna respond to the area and while they didn't hear any additional gunshots they quickly located the loud warnings from the parked RV and the first two responding officers advised dispatch of the possible vehicle bomb and requested additional officers. They approached the vehicle and saw there was a camera positioned above the rear view mirror and they retreated and waited for backup and requested a bomb squad to the scene. As they waited for the bomb squad, the decision to evacuate the nearby residences was made out of an abundance of caution. Five officers began knocking on doors to have people evacuate while one directed traffic away from the RV. And I know I've talked about this before, I think when we covered the Unabomber. P 
police, especially post 9-11, you have to treat these potential bomb cases as if it is an actual bomb. There's at least one or two times when I was a police officer where I had to deal with some type of suspicious package that people thought might be a bomb. And it's it's really a difficult thing. I know I talked about in the Unabomber case, but you don't want to be the person who's wrong either way. You don't want to make a big scene and evacuate people and wake everybody up and get a bomb squad and everything down to this, this scene and then find out you know this is just a prank or something. You feel terrible and you feel like an idiot. But at the same time, you can't treat it as if it's no big deal and then suddenly a bomb goes off and people are killed that you might have been able to save. So again, especially because of the the weirdness of the situation, the RV parked in downtown with the camera mounted on the side view mirror and these loudspeaker warnings, it wasn't as if it was just a suspicious vehicle parked downtown. This RV was just sitting, you know, parked in a fire lane or something like that and and somebody just assumed since it was Christmas there wouldn't be meter readers or parking enforcement or whatever it might be. There were specific warnings coming out of this van and, and something didn't look right and oftentimes officers will tell you they just can get a sense when they arrive on a scene like this that something's just not right. So they err on the side of caution and start waking people up and moving them away. Now this is, if you've seen pictures of the blast, it's a kind of old style downtown area in Nashville. So these are these brick facade buildings, uh, probably built you know, around the turn of the 19th, 18th and the 19th century. So older buildings, just kind of row, one row on each side of the street of these businesses down below. There's restaurants and that kind of stuff. And then apartments or condos above these uh, businesses. So your typical kind of downtown that isn't skyscraper New York style downtown. And it, it is also important, is that they got these five officers that are knocking on doors, telling people, get, get away from the street and likely they're probably focusing mainly on the buildings right next to where the RV is parked, these residents uh, right next to where this RV is parked. And then you've got one officer directing traffic. They probably blocked off the street to a certain degree with their squads, at least that's how I would have done it. But you still have to leave somebody out there because as I found over my 17 years in law enforcement, even if you block streets with Ca uh, squad cars or uh, road close signs or, or whatever barricades whatever it might be there's always going to be one or two people that try to drive around the, these cars or this stuff because they just have to get that little bit closer or they have to drive through that street even though they can go down one block and drive down the, the street just fine the next block down they you, you can't stop some people they just will not listen unless there's somebody there telling them they have to turn around so my guess is they got this one officer out there just kind of keeping anybody from driving up to the RV or getting closer to the scene. Around 6.15, a warning from the RV stated that the vehicle would explode in 15 minutes and then the song Downtown by Petula Clark was played via the loudspeaker. If you haven't heard this song, it was a pretty popular song, I want to say in the 60s or 70s. Uh, the it reached number one uh, and it's as I said if you hear the song you're definitely going to recognize it because it's been used in in movies and and that kind of stuff but it was just kind of this eerie you're getting all these warnings it's a computerized woman's voice it's not an you know, actual human voice that's giving you these warnings and then all of a sudden this song comes on it's it's almost something out of a movie and, and again if you were on scene you're probably having chills at this point and then true to the word, at 6.30 a.m., the RV exploded. And the bomb squad had been on the way, but had not yet arrived when the blast occurred. And this is probably actually a good thing that they weren't there. Uh, now granted, bomb squads don't just walk up to, especially a, a potential vehicle-borne IED. Um, 
it's just not something they do anymore. They would have sent up a robot to kind of get a better look at things. Maybe robot would have been able to go underneath the RV to see if there's a bomb underneath it, but they wouldn't get close to it until they were comfortable. And with this countdown going on, I don't think anybody would have risked approaching the vehicle during this countdown anyway. Uh, but it was just noted that I'm sure people were curious whether or not the bomb squad actually arrived before the blast. But the force of the blast sent debris over two blocks away, and when the dust settled, 41 businesses were damaged and one building collapsed. Eight people were injured by the blast, including two of the officers that had been tasked with evacuating the buildings. But in what many see as a miracle, no one outside the RV was critically injured or killed by the bomb. And initially, police had no idea if the RV had been occupied at the time of the blast. Thoughts of Timothy McVeigh's moving truck bomb that killed 168 people in Oklahoma City in 1995 and the ensuing manhunt entered the minds of many. And this is, again, covering these stories or by the time the media gets around to covering it, there's usually a lot more information out there. What I try to do when I cover these stories is put people into the mindset of either the victims or the investigators at the time that things are going on in the story. And so in this, at this point, you know, nobody has seen anybody inside this truck. Nobody had reported a man outside the truck before, or the RV, before it blew up. Nobody had reported seeing a man inside the RV. Police hadn't seen anybody inside there. So the time the, the RV exploded, police had to work under two assumptions. One is that somebody had been inside there and had been a suicide bombing, or two, that the, van, the RV had just been parked there abandoned set the bomb was set on a timer and to go off at 6 30 and the person was nowhere near and there's a potential that there's more of these uh, vehicle borne ieds around the city or that the guys on the run at this point so they've got to treat it both ways uh, but again at the time that this happened they don't know uh, whether or not anybody was inside the RV. And also unknown to police at the time of the blast, the vehicle had been parked at that exact location by the bomber to inflict damage on an AT&T service facility. Now, the FBI would actually come out later and say that this was not targeting anything specifically, but I'm gonna break that down later and, and stand by what I said here that I believe that it was parked here to, to inflict damage specifically on this service facility. The power supply for the facility was badly damaged, as was its backup generators. Service continued for a while on battery power, but soon after the bombing, cell service in the Middle Tennessee area and across America in general experienced outages. By noon, all communication in the area was deeply affected, with service outages affecting 911 dispatch centers, local hospitals, and the Nashville airport, which had to ground planes for an hour due to service issues with air traffic control. While some of the priority communications were established later that day, some outages continued for days. Many retailers in the area lost communication capabilities for credit card transactions and had to switch to cash only. This was a problem because banks and ATMs had also been affected by the outage, so cash wasn't easy to obtain. Four days after the bombing, residents were able to return to their buildings, and soon communication capabilities returned to full function. But many had questions about the bombing, most importantly who had done it and why. After the bomb squad arrived at the scene, they began an investigation into the bombing. With the assistance of the FBI and ATF, Investigators first needed to determine what type of explosive was used, and they conducted a sweep to ensure there are no other possible vehicle bombs in the area. Strangely to this day, roughly two and a half years after the bombing, officials have never released what type of bomb was used. Experts have weighed in, and the two most popular theories are either some form of thermobaric device, which uses a mixture of oxygen and an explosive fuel source such as methane, or some form of pyrotechnic device. Both of these theories are based on the high heat content of the bomb and the lack of typical explosive crater in the street. And, and this is what was frustrating about this. In doing the research, I found a couple articles and right away it was expert says bomb is a rare 
type never used in the US or something along those lines and you read that and you think okay well that sounds pretty good and then you find another article that says this expert says it was a pyrotechnic device you know, like fireworks and you think well that's pretty good and so then you go to the actual FBI report which is roughly four months after the incident they they put out this report and nowhere in the report does it list the type of explosive used. And some people believe this is to prevent some form of copycat where somebody sees the damage done by this device and tries to replicate it or make it even bigger or whatever it might be. But it, it's just interesting because normally they would release, I mean, we know what type of explosive device Timothy McVeigh used, uh, the same type that was used on the World Trade Center bombing in the early 90s. So it's not like the FBI never releases the, the type of explosive device used, but in this case, they seem to not want to release that. And it's, it's clear they would have known rather quickly. It talked about their investigative teams shipping the evidence to uh, labs at Quantico. It talked about them swabbing different items. And that's, you know, when we do, when you go through the airport um, now, when they do the little paper swab, if your bag has ever been... Uh, pulled aside to go through the extra search or whatever it might be uh, as you're going to fly and they rub that paper swab over your carry-on and items inside it or whatever and then put it onto a machine the machine is testing for traces of explosive chemicals and actually one of my duties with the National Guard was after 9-11 I was stationed at the Minneapolis airport providing security there until they got TSA up and running because there was a time after 9-11 if anybody recalls the TSA wasn't a thing yet uh, so it took them a little while as as it does in government to get this transportation security administration up and running and so they had National Guard at most of the airports just providing an extra measure of security and so I'd often I had these 10-hour shifts where I was just standing at checkpoints and would day after day after day it got pretty boring so i started paying attention to kind of the, some of the nuances of stuff that was going on and i had somebody explain to me once what those little paper swabs are and what they're doing and and you do every once in a while get an alert uh on somebody's luggage it's because the device that reads these chemicals is so sensitive that if you had any type of let's say you ever hauled fireworks in a backpack or for some reason road flares or you know, any type of or, or load your own ammunition at home and you've carried black powder or whatever it might be in a backpack at some point and then you go to fly with that backpack those explosive chemical residue that might still exist in, in the m most minute quantities in your bag but that's enough to set off those sensors now of course they're going to look and they're going to find you don't have a bomb in your in your bag or anything like that but this is when they do these uh, analysis after a bombing, they, they swab things and that's what they're looking for is they're, they're trying to get back a chemical makeup of the bomb. And when they put these swabs through these machines, it'll print out you know, the, the chemical components that exist in say ammonium nitrate or black powder, gunpowder, whatever it might be, that, that's, that residue is still gonna be there and so we know that they were on scene, that they were swabbing stuff, that they're sending stuff back to the lab. So we know they have the information, but the fact they're not releasing it to the public, I understand from a somewhat from a public safety aspect that you don't want to be telling everybody, hey, look, this guy used a brand new type of bomb nobody's ever used before, which unfortunately for some people would be a green light for them to try to build a bigger more damaging version of that bomb and set it off somewhere but at the same time i think it's kind of frustrating because it i don't know that it you know helps build public trust when the government has information that doesn't seem to be damaging i guess to a certain degree unless you're looking at it from the the angle i just talked about and you're not releasing it it, it it, it, between that and something we'll talk about later, I, I'm not a super big fan of how this incident was reported from the federal government. And and as I mentioned, both these experts, when I read the articles about what type of bomb they thought it was, both of them mentioned this was a more a high heat type of bomb uh, used 
temperature as part of its explosive property as opposed to actual explosive pressure. And that's how they indicate, if you look at the street after the bomb uh, RV is cleared out or the remnants of the, the bomb RV, uh, if, if you look at the street after uh, Oklahoma City, if you've ever seen those photos, where Timothy McVeigh's truck was parked, there's just this massive crater in the road. Uh, it looks like a bomb crater. And then if you look at the actual building in Oklahoma City, there's basically, it looks like somebody just tore a chunk out of the building in in a sphere type pattern and that's that explosive pattern whereas even though it's roughly the same size vehicle that's setting off this bomb in nashville yes there's damage to the nearby buildings but it it's definitely not the same amount of damage and it definitely the damage doesn't penetrate the buildings as far so again that's that's the belief of these experts that it wasn't one of these quote-unquote explosive based bombs using some type of typical solid explosive it was more than likely some type of a heat based explosive while officials have not released the explosive use they did quickly announce they had identified a suspect and he had been inside the rv when it exploded and was now deceased the suspect they named was anthony quinn warner a 63 year old nashville resident so who was anthony and why did he blow himself up on christmas morning in downtown nashville Anthony Warner was born on January 17, 1957, in Antioch, Tennessee, a neighborhood of Nashville. His father had been a longtime Bell South telephone company worker, and the company merged with AT&T in 2006. Anthony graduated high school in Antioch in the mid-1970s, and shortly after high school, he joined the Navy. After his two-year stint in the Navy, he was arrested for felony possession of marijuana, and he was sentenced to two years of probation. But between 1978 and 2020, he had no other major crimes on his record. Anthony worked in informational technology and owned his own burglar alarm company in the mid-90s. He had a civil dispute amongst his family members over a family home in 2018, and then in 2019, he was briefly investigated for making bombs. According to sources, the investigation began when his girlfriend, while being placed on a mental health hold, told police that Anthony was making bombs. Police investigated the information by going to Anthony's house and attempting what we call a knock and talk at his door. Officials later noted they saw an RV on the property, but it was behind a wooden fence. No one came to the door and no suspicious smells or anything indicating bomb making efforts was in plain sight. The department would later come under fire for this surface level investigation but the department stood by its stance that they had no evidence other than a complaint against him by somebody suffering from mental illness, and any further investigation would have been a violation of Anthony's civil rights. However, police did fail to check the final box in the investigation. They could have reached out to the ATF to see if any bomb-making material was being shipped to Anthony's home. Certain items, when ordered in either large or small quantities, depending on the item, are tracked by the federal government, and if you're purchasing a lot of bomb making materials, it's more likely police could get a search warrant of your property to investigate you for making bombs. So this was kind of made into a big deal after the bombing, because at first police came out once he was identified and said, you know, we have no record at all with this individual. And then somebody came across this report about him potentially making bombs the year before and then and i think it's at least it was still ongoing they never released a report the nashville police department said well we'll look into how we handled uh, that investigation and we've talked about it before law enforcement is always a a double-edged sword it's a damned if you do damned if you don't uh, type of situation you're always walking the fine line between investigating crime and violating somebody's civil rights and you have to take in what I've talked about before, the totality of the circumstances when you do this. It's not as if somebody with no mental health issues and solid evidence came forward and said, Anthony is making bombs. 
the statements were made from what I understand and this is there's different source material out there but from what I understand this stuff was these inferences were made while this woman was being put on a mental health hold and I had to do this several times throughout my career a, a lot of times where you put somebody on a mental health hold and they are going to say a lot of things uh, some of them are paranoid some of them have schizophrenia and yes you listen to them and yes you're definitely empathetic with them as they're telling you this stuff but at the same time if you took action on everything somebody who's schizophrenic or paranoid or, or the combination of paranoid schizophrenic tells you is going on as we're going to find out with anthony it's just not possible to to investigate that now i do give nashville police credit as i said they they went and did what we call a knock and talk that's where you don't have a search warrant but you you're allowed to just go to somebody's property and knock on the door and see if they're willing to talk to you if they tell you they don't want to talk to you or if they don't open the door it's not like you can kick down their door and go in and and you know start searching or anything like that but if you get this complaint and anthony comes to the door and says oh so and so yeah she's nuts we dated for a bit she's she's always telling me these crazy theories go ahead look around check everything out i'm not making bombs that's what nashville was hoping for and but that didn't happen here they kind of went halfway which is as far as they were willing to push it now as i said they could have gone one step further and contacted the atf because there are certain materials as i said if you order them in large or small quantities if you're either purchasing them or ordering them on the internet to be shipped to you they're going to raise some red flags and it might not mean that any direct action is taken against you at that time but if you get some report from somebody saying hey this guy's making bombs and then you go look and find out he's ordered a, or she has ordered a whole bunch of bomb making materials sent to their home then you have enough for a search warrant and you can go through the entire property see if there's bombs on property see if there's diagrams plans etc and and try to stop a bombing before it happens because that's the fine line that's the danger is pushing too hard and you violate civil rights don't push hard enough and you miss something that maybe could have prevented uh, something from happening down the road now as we're going to find out i don't know if even if he had been somehow caught or shut down in 2019 short of him being in prison and depending on the charges i guess that's possible but also not possible whether that would have changed what happened on, on christmas day 2020 and i say that because after the bombing an investigation into anthony's life showed his mental status was less than stable while no one that knew him considered him a threat, in fact, they actually said he was a nice guy and didn't think he could hurt a fly, they did say he was deep into conspiracy theories, especially those involving aliens. Now, Anthony had adopted several of the run-of-the-mill conspiracy theories, including thoughts on the moon landing being fake and the misguided notion that 9-11 was an inside job, but his true beliefs revolved around reptilian humanoid aliens running Earth and the fact that Earth has been attacked by aliens repeatedly since September of 2011. It sounds as if, when I was reading, that he had some mental health issues. He's always kind of a quirky guy, a nice guy, but kind of a quirky guy. And then 9-11 happened and he just went off the deep end into, into the land of conspiracies, into nothing is as it seems the government's out to get you and when you have somebody who has some whether it be certified paranoia or kind of goes down that path it's not difficult sometimes for these people to look at things around them in their life and draw a connection to their conspiracy theories and the more they watch youtube videos or in involve themselves in reddit chats or uh, different chat boards with other like-minded people it's pretty easy sometimes for these people to be convinced that a conspiracy theory is actually reality and uh, as i said they start seeing this reality around them 
So it sounds as if Anthony would often go to like this local state park by him and he would quote unquote hunt aliens there. He would use infrared goggles and claim that they could change their body temperatures to hide the heat, their heat signatures and that shooting them was no good because their skin deflected bullets. And so, he, again, it wasn't like he just kind of was one of those people that said, well, aliens might be real or Area 51 exists. This, this is a guy that actively went out and, and hunted for proof of his conspiracy theories and believed it with all of his heart. And to further these beliefs, just prior to the bombing, he sent several packages to acquaintances around the world. The packages contained his writings and beliefs and what he claims is proof that the world we live in is an illusion and there's no such thing as death. One news outlet did get their hands on this material, but decided not to publish it and give Anthony any more post-mortem notoriety than he'd already achieved. Initially, police thought that the high-density location for the bombing could indicate it was an act of terrorism, but that notion was quickly retracted. As more was learned about Anthony, police determined that the target was likely the AT&T Service Center, and they realized Anthony took actions to minimize collateral damage. This included the timing of the bombing, the gunshots, and the warnings over the loudspeaker. The timing of the blast was important. Anthony could have detonated the bomb at 1.30 a.m., but people would have been sleeping in their homes near the blast zone at that time, and it's unclear if Anthony knew just how powerful the bomb would be. And I, I say that because, especially when it comes to these large vehicle-borne born bombs, you can, you can make bombs, small ones, and out in the woods or on a rural property or whatever it might be, and you can blow up tree trunks or a car or something like that, but you're not really gonna be able to simulate what this bomb is going to do at full capacity in a neighborhood or in a downtown area until it actually happens. So it's very possible that Anthony had no clue whether his bomb was going to just create a big fireball or if it was going to level buildings with people living inside them. And so it's definitely obvious that he made some efforts to minimize the collateral damage. After parking the RV in the early morning hours, Anthony waited until it was early enough to wake people up, but not so late in the morning that there would be significant traffic in the area. He gave people time to get away from the RV with explicit instructions and a countdown as a final warning. This plan gave the police the time they needed to evacuate people from the most dangerous areas of the blast, likely saving many lives. If he had wanted to inflict as much damage and terror, he could have waited until the sidewalks were filled with people, gave no warning, and picked an even busier spot in town, such as outside the Nissan Stadium after Titans game was over. To me, it appears Anthony's main target was the AT&T service facility. According to sources, he was once employed by the company and worked in the building and knew where to park to produce the most damage and disruption. Although it's clear his mental health had some issues, it's unknown if his conspiracy theories included something against AT&T and their role in any of his beliefs or if they were targeted for a workplace grudge, as it was said he had some animosity towards the company. On March 25, 2021, a report was published by the FBI stating that their investigation had shown that Anthony worked alone and the bombing was not connected to terrorism. The bombing seemed to be an elaborate suicide plot driven by stresses in Anthony's life. The report states he was fueled by paranoia, conspiracy theories, and the deterioration of relationships in his life. It was also reported by friends that Anthony had recently received a terminal cancer diagnosis, although this was never confirmed by any member of law enforcement. The FBI would also say that Anthony picked the location because he felt it would create the biggest impact but minimize injury. And this is not something I totally agree with, as Anthony could have picked many riverfront parks or other areas in the city that had no residences near them. So to me, it appears he picked the location because of AT&T, but this is something the FBI did not want to state for some reason, possibly to deter cat-style attacks. And this is just, when I looked at the map of downtown Nashville, he's a block or two from the Cumberland River here, and, and most of the area along the river has these large 
parks and I'm assuming these large parks have parking lots or at least areas along the parks where you could park a vehicle and so to me if he just wanted to make this big fireball and make this statement and blow up an RV and and go out in the literal blaze of glory he didn't have to risk hurting people and it didn't seem like he wanted to hurt people so the whole thing of the risk and the warning and the evacuating the buildings and all that kind of stuff it seemed like that was necessary to him because of the location that he picked so had he picked a different location he picked one of these parks and just you know, had his vehicle in the middle of the park yes he could have still had warnings about staying away from the vehicle or he could have just blown it up in the middle of the night when no one was around and it still would have made a statement it still would have made the news as people still would have talked about it this this rv blowing up but it was this disruption to the at&t facility it was where he parked the rv so that it would cause the most damage to this at&t facility and the risk of parking there meant that there were potential for collateral damage that he had to mitigate through the loudspeaker through the gunshots through everything like that in order to not harm other people so to me it seemed like he took great effort to minimize casualties but that was a necessary thing because he wanted to park the rv where he wanted to park it so to me i don't quite agree with the fbi on saying that the at&t building was not his main target it definitely seems like it was and again i'll fall back to he has some friends saying he's got animosity for the company and most of his conspiracy theories involved this alien race that was running things in the world and i have to imagine it wouldn't be a far leap for the, him to believe that communication was a big part of this and by damaging this at&t service facility and knocking out communications like he did that he wasn't winning a small battle in, in the war against this alien race as, as he so said so again just as i read the fbi report the the lack of any information about the explosives used and kind of pushing away from this targeting of the at&t facility just basically claiming it was a suicide plot and he didn't want to harm anybody to me those are just ways that the, the FBI is putting things out there to prevent somebody from saying, oh, maybe I should go target an at t building and I'll use this explosive. So again, th that's my take on it. Maybe I'm wrong, but that's just how I feel. Now, speaking of copycats, a box truck was pulled over two days later on a stretch of highway near Nashville on December 27th. The driver had been parked outside a church in a large white truck blasting audio similar to what was heard before the bombing and it's unknown if this was the downtown song or if audible warnings were given the driver was arrested and charged with two counts of filing a false police report and tampering with evidence so as we've talked about before people with mental health issues or just completely misguided people they'll take every advantage and opportunity to do stupid things i guess is the best way to put it and so uh, the whole area was kind of on high alert after this and and two days after i i don't know if they had yet released that the bomber had died in this blast i think they had but at the same time some people probably still thought it's possible this guy just parked the vehicle and got away so an easy way to cause more fear and panic would be to try to replicate what he was doing and that's what this idiot apparently did uh, two days later in this box truck. And then on December 31st in nearby Lexington, Kentucky, another RV was parked in a downtown area and worried residents contacted the police. An explosive sniffing dog alerted on the RV and the area was evacuated. However, the RV was eventually cleared and found to have no explosives. And this is where, as I talked about with that device that reads the chemicals at the airport, uh, explosive sniffing dogs they're trained to smell these same chemicals and those same chemicals exist in road flares fireworks 
etc. So if you've hauled fireworks in an RV, if your RV is equipped with road flares for an emergency situation, there's a good chance that an explosive sniffing dog, they're just going to smell the chemical compounds that make up these explosives. They're not trained to smell a bomb. They're not, you know, they're they're trained to smell the chemicals that go into making a bomb or bomb components or whatever it might be. So the fact that the dog alerted on the vehicle made this more of a story, but ultimately it's there's a good chance again somebody at some point for a Fourth of July camping trip had fireworks in this RV or some form of, of gunpowder, and and ultimately, thankfully, it was it was not a copycat. Now, the final toll of the Nashville Christmas bombing was better measured in financial losses. 1,000 people lost their jobs due to damage and closure of several businesses, and 400 people were displaced from their homes, and several local businesses closed their doors forever. Already suffering losses from COVID-19, the bomb damage and shutdown of the area was the final straw for several downtown restaurants and one museum. But that is it for the case of the Nashville Christmas bombing. And, And like I said, I just wanted to cover something a little bit different. As much as I know people love listening to true crime, especially a good mystery, a good whodunit uh, type of a story or figure out why somebody uh, killed another person, I, I think it is interesting every once in a while to take a different look at uh, a true crime, whether it be espionage or bombings or, or something along those lines or, or weird suicides, uh, because I think it, it definitely opens up the mind to, to think about things a little bit differently from time to time, as opposed to just covering the same type of crime, just with different characters in, in each one. So, But that's it for today, guys. Thanks for listening. Stay tuned for future episodes, and feel free to write me at TrueBlueCrimeProductions at gmail.com. You can also find me at True Blue Crime Productions on Facebook, and support me via Patreon at True Blue Crime Productions. That's it for today, guys. Thanks for listening. Talk to you later. Goodbye.